state to state. We got your Nittany line update. It's a football discussion with Tom and Justin. So kick back and press play. With former Penn State and NFL defensive back Justin King, I'm Tom Hannafin. This is State of State. This podcast is presented by Bet Online. The holiday season is upon us with the NFL in full stride, plus the NBA and NHL hitting midseason form. Bet Online is your number one destination for all your sports wagering info. With up to the minute sports wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions, Bet Online is the top spot for all pro and college sports. And it's not just the big four. Bet Online is info available at your fingertips with both desktop and mobile access at any time for almost any sport from mixed martial arts to international soccer head to bet online today and remember to use our promo code believe that's b-l-e-a-v for your 50 percent welcome bonus on your first deposit state of state is presented by bet online where the game starts also, State of State is a proud supporter of Blue White Outfitters. Blue White Outfitters was created as a retail shop meant to highlight the confidence, competitiveness, and fearlessness of the elite athletes found throughout the history of Penn State University. Check out the latest Lockdown U and Lawn Boys merchandise today. All sales from Blue White Outfitters directly benefit Penn State student-athletes. Visit www.bluewhiteoutfitters.com today. And if you're looking for the perfect beer for Penn State football season, we've got you covered with the State IPA. Special thanks to our friends at Funk Brewing for creating the best tailgate and game day beer for Nittany Lion fans. A limited supply of the State IPA is still available now at beer distributors, grocery stores, Funk's tap rooms, plus select bars and restaurants. Visit www.funkbrewing.com slash beers slash state dash IPA to learn where and how you can get state IPA before it runs out for the season. Check out the link in the description of this podcast for more information. Must be 21 years or older to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the live post game show. Penn State wraps up the regular season of 2023 with a dominant 42 to nothing victory on the road at Ford Field in Detroit against Michigan State. Number 11, Penn State now wrapping up its fifth 10 win plus season in eight years under James Franklin. So the success continues to mount. And the biggest takeaway, I think, from this game, Justin, is Where was that offense all season? Because that was fun to watch. That was great. (laughs) No, that's exactly what you want to see, man. Like the 60-yard bombs, uh, efficient running the football, 200-yard rushers, Drew with, what, 292 yards, 17 for 26, spreading the ball around, making nice throws between the hashes, getting the tight ends involved. I mean, it seemed like everybody on the team touched the football. I mean, this is what you look like. This is what it looks like for having an explosive, balanced offense. So, I mean, too bad it's the last game of the season. But it's like I said, that good judge to go into the offseason, the bowl game, and everything else in the preceding months. Last game of the regular season. Can't hold anything back now. Uh, Ten receivers (laughs) caught passes, five rushers all together. Here's the thing that I think that was really interesting. It was pointed out on the broadcast by uh, the great Todd Blackledge, who we've had on this platform, and obviously broadcaster for NBC, part of the national championship team, once upon a time at Penn State, saying that, you know, we, we have had ups and downs with Drew Auer, quarterback Drew Auer this season. Started off with fireworks against West Virginia. Kind of ended with a very similar game here against Michigan State. And along the way, it was a roller coaster. But in the end, he's going to finish his first campaign as a starter at Penn State with 23 passing touchdowns, four rushing touchdowns, and one interception with over 61% completion percentage. Yes, there is a lot to work on. There's a lot to build on, but a, that's a damn good campaign right out of the gates for a starter, you know, in his first year. No, I don't think there's anything that you can't really complain about. I like we talked about the the two games against Ohio State and Michigan being kind of um letdowns just overall from the expectation standpoint. But I, I think I've been saying this all year where you just it's hard to beat him up, but so much for his first year and just the efficiency in which he's playing with putting points on the board and protecting the football. And when you get other things working around you, like those explosive plays, 
running backs having over 100 yards. Now you're really having a, an explosive offense where you're lo- looking like a dominating performance with 42 points to Michigan State zero. So, like, I mean, even another kudos to another shutout on the defensive end, and that's always hard. Big Ten team, uh, Delaware, regardless of what it is, keeping a, an opponent to zero points means they stayed out of the field goal range, and that's that's hard to do. Seven sacks for the Penn State defense, plus the interception there uh, early on in the game. Uh, Jalen Reed making that great pick early on, and that just kind of set the tone, which was fantastic. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for tuning into this live. Like, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications, rate us as well. Thank you to those of you that are watching live and hopping in the comment section. This will post after the fact on our audio-only platforms. A uh, comment here from Will, kind of echoing what we were just saying. Wish we had more of those big plays this year, but still a solid season. I completely agree, and a guy you and I were talking about before we even came on here, Justin, uh, Amari Evans catches that bomb from Drew Auer, and we've been talking about the shots downfield, quote, just throw it deep, right? That mentality that's popped up this season. Here's the thing that I keep coming back to, and Smoke Dixon has spoken about Amari Evans with you and I, and he's going to elaborate that more in our full conversation with him on Monday morning's episode when we talk to him, is that. Omari Evans and Drew Aller came in, same exact class, and they have shined in the two blue-white games that they've taken part in, but we just haven't seen a lot of Omari Evans in season. But when he gets the chance, these two have a connection, and it's that thing that's just, you you can't put your finger on it. Obviously, Omari is a brilliant athlete, as is Drew Aller, but they have that connection that it's it's something you can't teach. It's kind of like Sean Clifford and KJ Hamler back in the day. Just they had the Cincinnati roots and they could hook up like that. What what, what do you think is there between Evans and Aller to build on? I mean, it's interesting, right? Because Evans had he had the one catch for sixty yards, but I think there is a comfort comfortability with a quarterback when they're throwing it deep and who they feel comfortable throwing the ball to, right? Like who can actually get there, the type of uh, air you can put under the ball, and then you have the receiver that has the ability the speed to make those catches, whether it's the tracking ability and different things of that nature. But it is a connection between a receiver and quarterback. Because Even when you talk about deep throws and if your number one is like a fade ball and you have like that back shoulder fade, and that's like necessarily like that's a feel thing between the receiver and the quarterback. You've seen it a, a lot of times with Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams back in the day where they were just like, they had ESP, right? Like just going back and forth over. And with deep balls, that's what um, you would like to see. And like you said, maybe that's his his connection. And that's this. I mean, I want to say that's his longest pass of the season. And the air, it seemed like, for just the yeah traveling in, in the air. Of, yeah, I like just you're in, right in, in the air. Yeah, and I mean the Keandre touchdown against West Virginia. He you know, Keandre it. got a good like what twenty to thirty yards after the catch. Yeah. Right. Yeah, a hundred percent. So like even that feel of him tracking it and uh beating the res- the safety the up top. Great catch. And it was a it was a great setup too from the outside floods and the levels concept and work in the middle of the field. I, like I said, when we start working those levels in the middle of the field, start getting those safeties to bite up the cover for the linebackers, and next thing you know, psh, take it up, take it up top and take advantage of it too. I want to get to the the running backs, but you just kind of touched on something in terms of the offensive flow. And we were like, well, where was that all year? And granted, so much has happened in the last few weeks. Mike Yurcich fired two co-offensive coordinators and Ty Howell up in the booth and then Juwan Sider down on the sidelines and James Franklin kind of overseeing things. Uh, Danny O'Brien, offensive graduate assistant, basically operating as I would guess you would call him the de facto quarterbacks coach. Mm-hmm. This game looked remarkably different than the Rutgers game. This guy was thrilled to see the quarterback draws go away. He was thrilled <laughs> to see that. And wouldn't you know it, Justin, the quick passing game that we thought would work for Drew Aller. Well, gosh darn it. It seemed to really work for Drew Aller. <laughs> and granted, I'm going to go off of Eli's comment, comment here. Complete dominance. And I know it's against Michigan State, but I couldn't be more proud of a final strong finish. I agree, but this offense, the game planning, the identity, the way that they executed, I I loved it. What did you see that was so different, and why did it work? I think it was a a good mixture of type of plays. I think when the offensive offensive side of the ball was running the football the way they were, when you see Catron, I mean, him and uh, Nick Singleton going for 137 yards, 118 yards from Nick, that really opens up 
the defense. And I mean, from that standpoint, I, I, oh, I think the one key thing that we've seen all the season is when the tight ends get involved, it really opens up the different levels of the offense. And like you mix that in with a, a deep pass of Mari Evans, and then like the rest of the game is essentially what our offense looks like. But when those things are happening, you're completing or converting on third down and continue to keep the sticks moving. I mean, that it was it was I was I was pleased with the offense for the first time this season. Not the first time, but it's just an exciting all around. I mean, whether it's Jay Wan Sider calling the plays, whatever the case may be. But like, I mean, even last week was the first time that they had a chance to come together with a new office coordinator to get the second week. And if this is an incremental um, uh, advancement that we see from the offense, I'm, I'm excited to see how it goes into the offseason. And again, putting everything in perspective, the Rutgers defense certainly better than what Michigan State presented today. So I can understand, yeah, that first game out of the gates you have an emotional loss to michigan the next day mike yurcich gets fired and that day you gotta have to scramble and make plans who's doing what what are we doing over the headsets etc now you have a chance to get it together but still i give them a lot of credit you did it on a short week the, the team flew out yesterday they had monday off so they really had like two days of practice drew hour i don't believe even through on tuesday not sure what he right. did wednesday necessarily so this was a, a quick turnaround for this team and you and i talked about it it was like okay what are the what are the reasons for all these guys? You know, we can point to a million different things. Hey, you're 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 fighting for the next drive or the next snap or something like that. Or you're fighting to have an opportunity next season, or you're fighting to have good tape for the NFL draft, or to be able to play in the bowl game. Like, there's all these little reasons, but still, what gets players motivated? And I was so encouraged to see the entire team appearing motivated in this game. And then James Franklin taking care of the right guys, Olu Fashionu was pulled early in the third quarter. Frankly, I, I don't know if you'll even see him play in the bowl game. He has very high-end first-round potential. It could be the first tackle taken. So you don't know what his future is going to be. And, and same thing for a Chop Robinson who had an injury, came out, and they were just protecting him. So I, I really like the way that they did it. But, man, it's just uh, this, this just felt good for a, a season where the expectations were high. And, and certainly there's things to be disappointed about. but. There's not a lot of programs in the country that can be like, man, 10 and two. <laughs> it's, it's not, not I mean, and five times in the last eight years is, I mean, it is impressive to be completely honest and moving forward. Like we played a, a big time bowl game. We go 11 and two going into the off season. I don't know what the office coordinator position is going to look like, but when we talk about recruiting transfer portal. It still sets it up because a lot of these guys are coming back next year. Like we're not losing too many weapons. Right. And we've seen a lot of the production from younger players that got opportunities to play. I mean, Bo even came in and he showed a nice dichotomy in that red zone that just shows some different things, getting the ball to the running backs out of the backfield, catching the football and running the football. I mean, if this is like a formula that we can continue to move forward and mixing in those big passes and those shots with like Omari Evans or th different type of, um, prospects like that. I mean, I think the expectations are going to be the same next year. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, and they should be. They they, they really should, really should be. Um, yep. There's a lot of things to dissect here. Julian, thank you. Uh, you know, um, hell of a way to finish off the season. Completely agree. Paul getting in the comment section here. And now that's what I'm talking about. Completely agree. Listen, like I think a lot of us are watching this offense. And again, understanding this is a beleaguered Michigan State team so you put everything into perspective but still the way the offense was called the execution the play design the, it's like this this is good this is encouraging you got away from some of the things that inside draw play that seemed to go nowhere you got Nick Singleton off tackle you got him in space I want to talk about Nick Nick finally had a coming out party and I'm sorry that it had to be 12 games into the season but overall 18 carries, 118 yards, a touchdown, a long of 24, 6.6 .6 on the ground. And then he had two catches for 68 yards, a long of 53, uh, 72 yards after the catch receiving. Just, just a hell of a, of a day from Nick. The thing that I liked, you know, even the one, uh, the, the big long catch that he just, that I just mentioned was a quick bubble screen. He got him out in space and just bam, he has that straight line speed and he had a crease and he took advantage of it. And, Kind of like what you would talk about back in the day when it was Saquon and then Miles Sanders is that, hey, man, you don't need to put this guy in between the tackles. He needs off tackle counters. He needs a little toss outside. And they did a lot of that with Nick today and it worked. It was beautiful.
if he can't create space between the tackles, you create space for him as the offensive coordinator or the play calls. And that's what they did today, whether it's get him in out of backfield, like quick screens and letting him and take over the matchups where you're really leaning into your Jimmys and Joes. We know he's a special talent in the things that he does possess, but you have to put special talents in the special areas, right? There's only so many elite talents that can just make something out of nothing, right? So that everybody needs a little bit of something, even – we think of a Catron Allen, like some of the things that he does very well, like running between the tackle zero to five, sometimes making not, something out of nothing, but he doesn't have that big playability that Nick Singleton has, where it just one, one make one person miss and he can go for 70, right? And just those different aspects and using them in the right ways. It seemed like we use all the weapons in the manner in which they were supposed to be used today from the tight ends, the the quarterback, but the the bow the bow package, everything was kind of operating in in harmony today. And this, I mean, maybe it takes a maybe it takes a couple of weeks to get everything in order, but it was in order today. Listen, copy and paste this to the bowl game, <laughs> whatever that is. And listen, I'm I'm very anxious to see what bowl game Penn State draws. Uh, we'll find out obviously in the next you know couple of weeks after get through the, the conference championship games. But I'm very curious to see who that opponent is and what that platform is, if it's a New Year's Six. Hopefully it is. But, man, there's just so much positivity to take away from this. Uh, Julian in the comments section here, it's very tough to win games, but 10 games uh, for five straight seasons, uh, five out of the last eight. Uh, very impressive. Uh, the brutal Big Ten Conference having said all that. What's your guys' opinion on the newcomers joining the Big Ten? Justin, we've talked about this, and uh, you know, Smoke Dixon is going to chime in on this on uh, our Monday episode. Uh, it's about to get a lot, a whole lot harder, and as you put it, there will be a premium on scoring points in the new Big Ten. <laughs> no, there's going to be teams that have money to acquire talent, that have history of getting playmakers. You talk about Oregon, USC, them being able to recruit in a different manner on the East Coast. So, like, even the way that we recruit and intake talent is going to have. Um, a nice adjustment. So I think it's going to be very interesting to the whole dynamic of college sports. I mean, we've seen a major upheaval with NIL, transfer portal, and everything going on, but I really think that the conference realignment is going to really usher us into this new age of college football. We turn on Saturday afternoon. It's like, oh, Oregon versus Penn State on a normal game or USC versus Michigan, and it's a normal game. And then, like, how guys are getting recruited. I mean, we're seeing it now even in Pittsburgh where USC is offering more high school prospects in the Pittsburgh region. Like, a kid in Latrobe got an offer from USC, and you wouldn't have seen that, I mean, in the past five, ten years around here because it's just – I mean, there's some – I mean, like, a Michael Parsons, obviously, but this is the type of talent, but you see where they're going because it's a cross – I mean, it's a cross-country game and that the way that the teams are built – I mean, it's it's the closest thing that we're going to have to that next step to the NFL. So it's exciting. Like a team like Oregon and um, UW and just like, again, the money influx, being able to, the, the, again, the transfer pool, the talent acquisition battle is just going to be extremely interesting to me because I think in college football, the talent discrepancy is where you win 75% of the battles um, on the field. So it should be exciting next year. And I don't want to rule out UCLA and Chip Kelly's style of offense, which was once upon a time Oregon style of offense. So I, I'm very interested to see that because there's been so much talk, especially today because of that very clunky last minute win for Iowa at Nebraska. Iowa is also 10-2 and two, somehow, somehow and will face the winner of Ohio State and Michigan next weekend uh, in the Big Ten championship game. But I mean, you know, Nebraska was one win away from being bull eligible at six and six. That didn't happen. And the entire Big Ten West is defined by defense, as Josh Perry was talking about on NBC. And, you know, that that's kind of what a lot of the the conference has been, and that the top four defenses feature uh, in the country feature Georgia, Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State in terms of statistics. So you, know, you can look at that in terms of the strength of opponent that Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State have faced through the year. I, I completely understand the arguments that are presented there, but still, it, it, things are going to change. And it's, it, there should be that concern within the Lash building of it's no longer trying to beat the top two teams. I mean, it's still there. It's still trying to get there, Justin. It's that being that third team isn't a given. It's very much you could be anywhere from third to eighth 
if you don't keep pace with all these teams that are coming in. And what's the what's the old adage? Uh, rising tide raises all boats, right? Raises all ships, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean that that is true in the sense of how the Big Ten is going to be looked at. I think it's going to be the premier conference, even when you think of media rights or just the viewership and the the conference that a lot of players want to play in for business reasons but with that being said like teams have to keep up with their talent acquisition process i keep saying because like as teams transition into the big 10 i think there's going to be a little bit of balancing out of how rosters are constructed sure um but like oregon has the ability to get any player that they want and they have a history of having athletic athleticism that's elite. And so like, they're going to be able to battle with, you know, the Ohio States and those top programs like ourselves. I mean, you dub, we played them in the um, PlayStation Fiesta Bowl a while, mm -hmm. a while back. And just like, so these are elite programs that are coming into the fold. I think even UCLA, they're a little bit behind just in the sense of the, the, the profile school, like they have harder academics to just take anybody in from the transfer portal and things of that nature. So it's just, they're a little different, but another option for, players that are coming out of high school that they can you know attend to continue to uptick their talent on that side so i mean i'm excited about the new big 10 to be completely honest because it's going to be exciting every single week and you're not going to be able to win games by scoring 21 points right you're going to have to put some points on the board it's not going to be such a defensive heavy um, situation because those offensive games out there are built to get guys in space and let athletes take over. So that's the fun part of football. Even though the fall can feel jam packed, Hello Fresh makes whipping up a home cooked dinner actually doable with quick and easy options, including their 15 minute meals. That's less time than it takes to get delivery. And with everything pre-portioned and delivered right to your door every week, it really is a no-brainer. Some of my personal favorites, the pub-style shepherd's pie is delicious, and the fully loaded pork taquitos, two of my favorite dishes, and Justin, on top of that, they're healthy, they're fresh, and they save me time and money. Talk about convenience, something that tastes good, and saving money. I mean, it's essential in my life where I'm just running around, whether it's podcast, talent management, dealing with my daughter in tennis and moving around and having a healthy, convenient meal that saves money on the grocery bill and just the food budget is amazing. It's a plus one in my book. You hit the nail on the head. We all know HelloFresh takes the hassle out of mealtime, but did you know it can also save you money? HelloFresh is 25% less expensive than takeout. So that means you can get an easy home cooked meal on the table and more money back in your pocket. So head to HelloFresh.com slash 50 lion and use code 50 lion. That's five zero L I O N for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash 50 lion and use the code 50 lion five zero L I O N for 50% off plus free shipping. Hello Fresh, America's number one meal kit. I'm fine with it. I'm good with it. There's a lot of questions that are just coming in the chat here, so let's get to these. Um, this one is, this game has me wondering what could have been. Was Mike Yersich really that bad, or was the offensive success we saw in this game really a product of the opponent? What do you think? I think there's a, uh, this team has been in a, a wreck all season. They haven't had a defensive of we haven't had a head coach um, for the last five or six weeks. Michigan that, State. Saying. Michigan State is what I'm yes. saying. But with that being said, the execution is what I always look to. And I think the guys, the way they executed today was at a premium level. So whether it was the offensive coordinator, whether it was the flow of the game and the quarterback put, being put in a position where he was comfortable making easier throws to where he can – sling it a little easier next time where he has confidence to hit Amari Evans for a 60-yard strike down the middle of the field. And when your running backs are running the football the way that they are, the offensive line is blocking, that's what happens when you have a balanced offensive attack and everything's hitting on all cylinders. It's a beautiful symphony of execution. And when guys are actually producing and executing the plays the way they, the way they need to, you have 42 nothing outcomes. I, I if, in terms of the part about was Mike Yersich really that bad or was the offensive success we saw in this game a product of the opponent? I, I yes, I do think the opponent had something to do. I, Forty-two to nothing. Obviously, the opponent was a f factor here. 
I don't think Yursic was that bad. Did they need to make a change? Yes. I think we've seen it, it's it's too small a sample size, in my opinion. What you saw against Rutgers was like we just said moments ago, co-offensive coordinators scrambling on what five days notice to try and figure out how in the world Ty and Juwan are going to work this thing. And then also Franklin with oversight, Danny O'Brien working with the quarterbacks. Like that, that's a lot. So you kind of take the Rutgers game for what it is. And I was like, all right, you got out of there with a win. It was a disappointing win, but you know, it's still a win and a, a decent opponent, a much better opponent than this Michigan State team. Then this offensive game plan looked completely different than what you saw against Rutgers. So even what we see in the bowl game, it's still too small a sample size. And by the time, it, probably within the next week or two, ideally, Penn State's announcing a new offensive coordinator. So I don't, I don't know if we're ever really going to know until this next guy gets in there. And with your sitch, I think, yes, there were some stagnant things within the play calling that had to go. We just talked about that inside draw play that would go nowhere, absolutely nowhere, going to the running <laughs> game probably a little bit too often it was it was galen hall-esque of run on first run on second and then you're quote behind schedule on third down and now you're putting drew in obvious passing situations and defenses can blitz yes i think those things were a problem but then there are also plenty of things over the last three seasons you can point towards at, at mike your getting a lot out of players so it, it's very difficult to comprehend that part of the question i'll, I'll say that yeah, I don't like to say. I mean, is he that horrible? I mean, I, I don't I look at the numbers that his offense averaged. I think his upper thirties in terms of point production mm -hmm. than when he was the offensive coordinator. So I don't think again, like a coordinator is supposed to organize the the orchestra of everything's going on. So like from that standpoint, I don't think there was areas where he did. Was he productive and effective at times? Yes, having better talent also goes in that area too, right? So it's it, it's it it's fluctuates for me because we mentioned Chip Kelly, like somebody like his offense, like his best offense that he had. He, he had Mariota and some of the most prolific offensive players that we ever seen in college football. So you just I, my thing is you just can never find a great offensive coordinator without great players. And so at that with that being the case having the charisma or having just like the play calling and charting how it's going throughout the game and the rhythmic flow is like the main thing of offense corner. So that's why I think the one thing we've seen these past couple games, even against Rutgers, even though they didn't execute as well, I don't feel like it was, it was ever, uh, I'd say clunky or just, they were never stale. They were just playing like Rutgers was playing good defense, but like we yep. were kind of running our offense the way we ran it. Like we committed to the run. We were running the draw. We not, might not like the draw, but they were like getting their handle on them right. calling the plays. And today was a little bit more dynamic, throwing the football, spreading the football around, getting our guys in the space. And so I think, again, sample size is small, but I, I like the like the past two weeks and just the progression that we've gone in. And shout out to J1 and Ty for taking the reins over for the offensive coordinator um, these last couple of weeks. It, literally, like, in the span of 12 days, having to deal with all this stuff, like, craziness. And a holiday on top of that. hundred No, that's real. Uh, question here from Chris. Not saying a 10-win season is bad, but a five-star quarterback like Aller and others running more than throwing – uh, wide receiver issues aside, are we just afraid to throw the ball? If so, will Aller enter the transfer portal? Uh, the last part of that, will Aller transfer, uh, enter the transfer portal? I, I think last week I personally had that fear considering how things went against Michigan, went against Ohio State, and even the Rutgers win was a little bit, ooh. Had this game felt like the Rutgers game had felt, I would be sitting here saying, yeah, I'm concerned Drew Aller's going in the portal. After seeing what just happened there and seeing his body language on the sideline, like that's a guy that's committed. So to me, at this point, I would think I would be surprised if he went in the portal. But again, we have to see who this offensive coordinator hire is. And it and, and that's something Drew Auer is going to have to weigh himself personally. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that, Justin. I mean, I think that's fair. Uh, he looked to see, he looked like he was having a good time today. Like with the coaches, with uh, O'Brien as the quarterback coach, it seems like they have a nice rhythm him and Bo to be completely honest um, from that standpoint but moving forward I mean after you get done with a game like this I don't think you're looking to go anywhere you're just excited 
to get the new playbook and understand what our new philosophy is and say like, hey, we can do this because he's leaving the season feeling pretty, pretty damn good. 292 yards, you know what I mean? Efficient day, no interceptions. Like you said, I don't know what, what two interceptions the whole season or one. One interception the whole season, and uh, I'm not sure how many fumbles he had, but, uh, but I mean, but I guess what I'm saying is like you, this is a play that he should feel like he can build and execute here, especially coming off of today. And the new offensive coordinator will be, um, I think will have some weight to it in terms of him. I don't think he's leaving or going anywhere, but I think have some weight to like how he approaches the next offseason and, and going into the next year. Sure. And then the other part of this question, uh, wide receiver issues aside, are we just afraid to throw the ball? Based on what I saw today, I wouldn't say that. Um, and granted, it's a case-by-case -case basis. What you would be able to accomplish against Rutgers, you are not going to be able to accomplish against Michigan State. I mean, vice versa, I guess, makes more sense. The Mich Rutgers defense is much better than the Michigan State defense. So, But again, this was a completely different offensive game plan than what we saw last week. Yeah, I mean, and like you, like you said, we've had so many people touch the football today. I mean, you got to talk about the tight ends getting involved, both running backs, all the receivers. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just kind of it, it seemed like he was spreading the wealth with the football a little bit. And when you have that many playmakers, sometimes it it does feel like it's hard to get in a rhythm to get everyone involved. So see how that continues to go. Will in the comment section, is it great defense against mediocre offense in the Big Ten or great offense and mediocre defense and defense in every other conference? I guess only time will tell. Will, you're right. Time will only tell because I think the SEC kind of has the inverse of that. For a long time, the SEC had some really great defenses and they've kind of turned that situation on its head and that a lot of really great offenses, but given up a lot of points at the same time. You don't see that same bite from these defenses in the SEC anymore. Even when you have the powerhouses of the SEC going up against each other, it's 40 to 42 type games or something like that. They're shootouts, uh, which is reminiscent of the old Pac-12 days. And then I would say the Pac-12 that we've seen this season outside of the huge sums that USC would allow, you saw some real defensive battles that Oregon State Washington game the other night, granted in the rain, but that was a defensive battle for the most part. So I, I think, especially in the Big Ten, Justin, historically, it's been great defense against mediocre offense, especially for the most part this season in the Big Ten. No, you're absolutely right. You know, the two teams that get out of the Big Ten that, that represent the, us in the country are typically Ohio State and Michigan because they have the offense to go along with the superior defense. So, I mean, that's what I think we're going to continue to see. It's going to be very interesting to see what we spit out with the new uh, the new group coming in from the Pac-12. Farzad here in the comments section. Someone help me temper my expectations for next year. I'm already feeling hopeful. So Farzad, I feel you. I really do. Because I felt hopeful going into this season. And again, 10-2 and two is not a bad year. However, given the hype, the expectations – the potential of a Big Ten title, the college football playoff, the national championship scene. Yes, there. Are, th this season can be looked at to a degree as a disappointment, but still 10-2 and two and potentially 11-2, and two, potentially a New Year's Six Bowl game. There's so many positives to take away from that. I'm going to say this, Justin. I'm not going to be hopeful about one thing next season because the entire <laughs> conference changes. You get a 12-team playoff next year. There is nothing that I look at on this team and I think this will absolutely happen, good or bad. Prove it to me. Because if this team is going to make the, the leap from good to great to elite, I'm done sitting here and saying like, oh man, I think they're going to do this. I think, nope. Prove it. That's what next year is to me. Prove it. Yeah, they're, they could finish 11 and 2. And so coming into the coming into the season next year, I think the the prove it is like beat Ohio State of Michigan. I think everybody can still be excited about making it to the playoffs and getting it and playing for a shot at the national championship. I think that's a healthy expectation. And I think, I mean, if the playoffs was the same way the past five years, Penn State would probably be in the playoffs. So with that moving forward, it's even with it being a little tougher in the Big Ten, the structure of what we're aiming for is getting a little more lenient in the sense of we're positioned to get into that space and have a chance to play in that dance. So my point is maybe to prove it to like play in the dance and beat the rest of the teams in the top in the country, like Ohio State and Michigan, 
But um, eleven and two with a lot of returners coming back, I think they're going to. I think the team internally is going to have high expectations as well. And I'm fine with them having those expectations. I am going to be the person who folds his arms and says, "Show me you can do it." I I feel like a parent trying to guide my kid on a bicycle. It's like, oh, I can do it. Great, go ahead and do it. Let's see you do it. <laughs> like yeah, through it, like not just through the bicycle, but almost more through like the the toughest terrain on a mountain bike. Like let's watch it. Like they already rode they rode they rode the bike eleven yeah. and two. Like I'm saying eleven and two because of the bowl game. But if they finish the team finish the season eleven and two seven overall with mm. all the returners coming back, quarterback. The same excitement is going to be coming into next year, and we should have it. And I think all the fans of Penn State are going to be like, "Well, let's see what we do against Michigan and Ohio State." That is going to be the elephant in the room, almost like the, right. the Boston Red Sox, like right, like it's like the, it's the curse at this point. That's how it feels. Now, so, no Michigan next year. You have Ohio State, you have Washington, UCLA, and USC on the schedule. I'm blanking on who exactly is on there, but I don't see. think. SC on there? Do you have it in front? I'm pretty sure SC is on there. SC is definitely on there. I know Ohio State's on there, and I think I want to go to the game. That's why I remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was going to say you're definitely going to go. <laughs> well, you're looking that up, uh, Rob. I want to get to your comment here. Good win, balance attack. Great to see Katron and Nick both having good games. Completely agree. We gave Nick his flowers. We should give Katron his flowers. Katron was freaking awesome in this game. Uh, what's his final 15 for 137 yards on the ground, uh, averaging 9.1 on the ground, just outstanding. And then on top of that, three catches for 17 yards and a touchdown through the air. Katron Allen has consistently the last few weeks come out as the starter, the starting running back for this offense. And he has delivered. He really fits what this offense is all about. And it's not just, oh, it's a fit historically within a James Franklin offense or something like that. No, he fits what this team is best at from a personnel standpoint, which I love. Um, I know you looked up the 2024 schedule. Can you refresh my No, memory? yeah, they got I don't know, 100%. They got UCLA, USC, Ohio State, and UW, or essentially, I don't say the big games, but you know what I'm saying. Those are all, <laughs> all of those are big games. And then, oh, by the way, all four of those are losable games. Right, right. No, that's exciting. That's I mean, that was next season at Wisconsin too. That's on the schedule. Like Wisconsin is never a slouch. I'm, I'm probably giving UCLA a little bit more credit than they deserve, but still, yeah. <laughs> so call it call it three games. Washington. I know Penix will. Penix is gone. I think next season. Yeah, um, he'll be out. I'd be stunned if Caleb Williams was back next season. And Ohio okay. State should be better. So it's like, all right, th those are three games, and. Now it goes from, uh, here's a comment from Chris kind of alluding to this, our last window was this year to make the four-team college football playoff, and there was a certain status that came with that. Now next year, it's like, it's 12 teams. So the, the excuses go out the window. It's like, okay, next year, now the expectation is you better freaking make it. I, and, and I think that's a fair expectation because based on like our, our finishes in the past years, when we've had 10, 11 win seasons, we would have been in the playoffs. So I think this, like the expansion of the playoffs really helps us <laughs> like as a, as a, as a, as a program in general, how people view elite national programs, because there's not going to be 12 that people see when we run against records of Alabama, I've said it earlier, Alabama, Clemson, and some other teams, or Ohio State versus everybody against the field, it's a very lopsided record. That's why even James takes the heat that he does against Ohio State and Michigan, but a lot of other coaches take the same type of heat. Like, Ohio State takes a lot of heat for, I mean, not Ohio State, but Michigan was taking a lot of heat for the way that they were losing to uh, Ohio Where's State the previous year. And it, it because it was like the four, like the four horsemen, where it was like the four strong teams, and yet one that kind of got in. So now it is basing out the twelve. I think it does put Penn State in a different light, just on the national scene. But with that being said, expectations and fall from grace happen often, and you have to be ready for it. So I, I, the new age of college football is exciting to me. So I'm, I'm really excited about next year. It's it's really exciting. Uh, before we wrap up, Justin, I, I feel like I always ramble on about the offense. Um, defensively, your guys locked down you, uh, the entirety of the defense, just stellar in this game this entire season. Uh, what did you see today from 
guys that you know we we knew what uh, chop robinson was going to do we knew what an adisa isaac was going to do but some guys that are going to be around in 2024 that's like man there's some building blocks here and like crazy building blocks like they made a lot of plays today like just make it like we were seven sacks that really a lot of sacks today. seven sacks seven, seven sacks today a shutout i mean that's what i, I don't want to say it's like breeze over a shutout like it's a easy thing to do but to keep someone out of field goal range for four quarters and they're on scholarship as well is extremely hard. So kudos to that defense. And we've seen like Cam Miller making plays. You got um, the t young Tony Rojas making, making plays and, and flashing. So we know that there's depth and talent on the team. I'm excited to see where that defense continues to go because we're going to, there's a lot of returning starters and the makeup and the culture of Penn state defense has been, consistent to where you can bank on them to be a top 10 defense next year as well and getting this offense under control should we look into this 12 this 12 uh team playoff to have some fun the 2023 regular season is over sadly penn state wraps it up however 10 and 2 with a 42 to nothing victory against michigan state on the road to wrap up november now we look forward to what bowl game will the nittany lions draw we are going to have to wait and see over the next few weeks uh thank you all so much for coming along with us on this ride through the regular season we are going to continue to cover this team as we do year round and into the bowl game uh don't forget this coming monday we're going to be dropping the full conversation with 24 7 sports college football analyst smoke monday in regards to the offensive coordinator search the future of the big 10 conference which we've been talking a lot about the transfer portal so much to be addressed in the next few weeks and especially in the off season for penn state football but still the bowl game to get to so thank you all so much for joining us as always once again the final score penn state 42 to nothing against michigan state Thank you all so much for joining us. This episode and our entire library of shows is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, let us know what you think of the show on Twitter, at TheKing1 and at Tom Hannafin. State of State is presented by Bet Online.